racist uh, values and making very uh, racist statements in their writings, uh, basically denying black citizens the same vote that they were fighting for. Um, and so in trying to promote their core values, they were actually backtracking on the very main thing they were fighting for. And so if we don't include more voices and uh, try to have these discussions, we can end up actually watering down the very values that we claim to uphold. Yeah, I think you make a really good point about like diversity of thought in general being really important for social change. Uh, Rabbi Lawson, did you have anything to add? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, of course, I agree. And there's a great theological foundation in Judaism to these kind of difficult conversations and diverse points of view. Of course, that theology hasn't played out historically in every case, but I think that m most liberal Jewish communities today are in, a, are in a strong place where we are open to those explorations and digging into and challenging one another on living up to the ideals that we profess. Thank you. Finally, um, Dr. Lundberg, did you have anything to add? Um, so yes, I think um, throughout the different verses in the Quran, there was always an emphasis that uh, conversation always builds bridges of communication. Um, in the Quran and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and even previous prophets were also always mentioned in the Quran and uh, where they had held many conversations with those that they had been sent to. Um, the Quran itself actually held a lot, uh, many conversations with um, the idolaters, the Jews and uh, the Christians and even other faiths to convey the message. Yet I would like to just mention a couple points here that interfaith and for the Muslim community many times has probably a different connotation and there are a number of different reasons to it. Um, most of the times um, interfaith is actually confused with universalism or syncretism and where the, the uh, syncretism and universalism, of course, involves merging and assimilating several methodologies or religions. Um, although interfaith does not mean such, but the pressure of postmodernism and the practical side of interfaith is mostly focused on showing the similarities and most importantly regarding that liberal, Western, postmodern, feminist, LGBT, atheist, and secularism as the paradigm that other faiths are expected to be compared to. Um, interfaith is not about getting rid of borders to create a new religion, but it is supposed to be about creating awareness on the borders between the religions by understanding the differences. We should not deny these differences to be able to assimilate and coexist peacefully. I think one of the main goals of interfaith dialogues is to get rid of the stereotypical images relating to other religions and have a better understanding on the tenets of on the tenets of uh, the, the faith of other religions and worldview and ideas. Uh, ideologies. Um, it's about understanding others and not necessarily accepting their views. Um, in the Quran, the word say or all the different derivatives of the word said and the roots of that have actually appeared more than 1,431 times times in the Quran and we're talking about 6,236 verses and and that's why when we speak about interfaith it should be in understanding others removing stereotypes and coexisting without denying the differences and what infer interfaith should not be is one a way to reform their religion it's in its basics and foundations or going from interfaith to a unifaith or embracing relativism or deifying liberalism or denying the right to call others for what they think is the truth sorry for the long um that long answer no thank you so much i think you explained that perfectly and um yeah maybe this would be a good time to acknowledge that everybody here on the panel has um, is coming from a really different background and um just because we're here with faith as a uniting factor doesn't mean we agree on everything and obviously um, a lot of people on the panel might have some deep-seated differences in beliefs about things but yeah it's still exciting it's exciting to have everybody here with different perspectives and um, being able to have these interfaith conversations like you mentioned um, so thank you for that response and thank you Amy, for sharing so we'll move on to our next question um, so religion can sometimes create division between people of different backgrounds 
how can we promote faith as a Unitarian rather than a divided force? Yeah, and anyone can speak on that um, if it seems like anyone wants to hear. Well, I, I guess I'll start again. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, one of the main problems of why faith can be so dividing is because uh, often uh, conversations around faith happen in bubbles. Uh, and so we talk to the people who we agree with, and you know it's very much the same with politics, right, and social media of catering uh, to what we like and what we think um, and never actually taking the chance to operate or to interact with something that is maybe foreign to us. Um, and so I think when we stay in our own camps, our main focus uh, can tend to be what we disagree on. Um, and it allows us to remain in an us versus them mentality. Um, and when we actually have conversations with people of different faith traditions, we'll usually find a lot of common ground. Um, in fact, uh, I thought this was pretty interesting. Researchers at Dartmouth have found that religiously <clears throat> conservative individuals have more in common in social and political beliefs with religiously conservative people of other faiths than the religiously liberal brethren and vice versa. Uh, so rather than focusing on different theologies, it can be unifying to see how our points of view on God and what he's like, can in the scripture and traditions point to similar uh, goals and values. Um, I think this can help create a more powerful coalition in spheres like voting, business, education, to see the changes that we all want to see in uh, the race sphere. Yeah, definitely. I really appreciate how you specified, like, give clarity to how it, I think the bubble specifically that exists is a really, um, like, you know, what you uh, just said, it's a point of pride for us and the way that we discuss it too. So I'd like to add one thing. I think I would like to first comment on the phrasing for the question of the question, um, which may insinuate that no faith um, can create peace on the other hand and faith creates divisions is something I would like to probably disagree on. Allow me since we're doing interfaith here because that's usually and many times the I would say the the modern uh, secular um, I would say marketing that that wants to present that no faith is actually better than faith, which is something really dangerous in where, in fact, faiths have more in common than like uh, just like Clay um, had mentioned, faiths have more in common to agree on than actually no faith, because there is a lot of commonalities, for example, between Christianity, Judaism, and Islam in considering morality and considering principle and considering the the, uh, the sanctity and the sanctuary of human life or the sanctuary of people's property or the sanctuary and the respect for uh, for chastity and family and reproduction and, and familyhood and etc. So those are things that different faiths and especially Christianity, Judaism, and Islam would actually consider as as um as the founding as the, the founding relationship between man and and um and, and God Almighty. Now it's you know that's just one little uh one little comment right there, but it is part of human nature to disagree, dispute, misunderstand, or even debate in understanding um understanding of life or its purpose and later our understanding of ethics and morality and how we implement it. Where does the problem actually take place? Secular politics has its own definition of life in its own ways, and of course the definition of morality and relativism. Some religions have their understanding of life, God, morality, and definition of social, economic, and political justice. But faith becomes a dividing force when such a faith uses compulsion, economical abuse, or political force to indoctrinate or abuse people's rights from other faiths. 
religion is oftentimes used as a tool that politicians abuse and use to gather human forces under the name of God to abuse other people and even abuse their resources. Politicians used this during the Crusades and even today in Palestine, it's used in the same type of in the same type of understanding where it's under the pretense of God. Today, many quote unquote human rights claims are still used as an ammunition to cover up political and economical abuse. And more importantly, they attack on people's identities to enforce a form of social and economical subordination. Justice is the most important human right that everyone must agree on. So just a little note on the question and also even some note on how we probably, you know, can answer that question. Yeah, no, thank you, Dr. Wadsworth, for the... Um, Sophia and Denny, if you guys can solve the problem with your microphone, um, that would probably... Is it too quiet? It, it's really quiet. Oh, okay. It, there you go. Clay and our rabbi here is also, um, I think, agreeing with me. Is it a little bit better now? It's a little bit better. Okay. You might want to get your laptop or whatever system you're using for the Zoom to probably get it closer to the microphone or at least get it closer to you. Yeah, do you want to pull the laptop closer? Or um, turn up the volume on the, on the speakers? Okay, we'll let them figure it out. I'll just, I'll just talk louder. <laughs> in the for the time being but thank you for your pushback on that question i i do think that there was like a little bit of implicit um connotation there that religion is the problem but i like how you pointed out that it's it's just part of the human condition to disagree um and it's not necessarily something that's unique or inherent to religion and that people abuse it um yeah but we'll move on to the next question uh what are some of the challenges and, and benefits of participating in interfaith discussions is this a little bit better? It's a little bit better. Okay. If I may, I think the benefits are extreme, that we need a space and an ability to talk about things without the goal of changing other people's minds, but to understand better the connections we have. And I agree that I think we're in a sort of 2.0 of interfaith relations. 1.0 would have been be coming together and finding every kumbaya moment of, oh, you believe in peace and I believe in shalom and salam and, oh, isn't it wonderful? Let's sing a song. That's great, but that's not going to get us anywhere. We need to be able to have honest, challenging conversations about those things which, which upset us and challenge us in our own faith and ways to understand other people's religious um, beliefs authentically. So I think it is um, the, the, those challenges come, and for the Jewish ear, especially historically, come, let's speak about religion has often been just a different way of saying, come, let me convert you. And so a lot of Jewish community response to interfaith work has been challenging. I found in, in my doing this for about 20 years that people still, Jewish communities still reflexively are pushing back against that. But it, it is essential. It is essential because we live in this world with many faiths. And it's essential because we need to find ways to build together in coalition while maintaining our authentic selves. And there are ways to do that without sort of lowering it to the common denominator of, of just uh, kumbaya moments. Nothing wrong with kumbayas, but, you know, let's move. Um, I think I agree, if you allow me, I think I agree with the rabbi here that it's, although there's always that pressure to speak about the commonalities, speaking about the differences are actually very important because a lot of these discussions can become very hypocr hypocritical if we're only talking about the commonalities and really not talking about the differences. So when we speak about the differences, um, in, of course, it should be a very uh, transparent communication. 
And But on the other hand, while we're talking about the differences, I think it's really important to mention um, a certain pressure where, whether it's me as a Muslim or um, the rabbi as a Jew or whether um, Clay uh, uh, as, a, as a Christian, I think there, there are a number of things that I'd like to point out here. There's the pressure to somehow embrace universalism and it's always present. We must not forget the pressure of secularism and postmodernism with its relative understanding of ethics is definitely always present. There's a common pre-assumption that Western, liberal, secular definitions of morality is the standard definition or the epistemology of human rights and justice and even women's rights. And in most interfaith conversations, such assumption, even though not always, clearly mentioned it's always present in our subconscious mind most conversations end up comparing that particular religion's definition of morality to liberal postmodern and western contemporary definitions of morality and of course the closer or even if the speakers cherry-picked verses that support modern definition of morality be, that particular religion becomes or at least there's that pressure to appear um, modernized quote-unquote civilized religion and of course what is meant by civilized and modernized is really how closer it is to the contemporary definition of liberalism most of the times religious groups that join such conversations are often reformed quote unquote and by that reformation they had clearly redefined their religion by eliminating or reinterpreting their religious text to suit um liberal postmodern definition of morality this is just you know just on the side of why at many times I would say interfaith um, di interfaith dialogue becomes challenging for a lot of the different religious um, groups, and especially if they are actually conservative. So just on a side of why many times we don't see other groups probably joining in is really that that pressure being present in our subconscious mind without us realizing, even though not many are willing to speak it up, I think there's a, um, there's a, uh, that voice is starting to rise that, hey, that's not DFI liberalism too much. Yeah, I think that was super good. And uh, sorry, Sonia. <laughs> uh, sorry, and um, I think it also comes at a root of uh, wanting to be liked by everybody we encounter with, wanting to be accepted by everyone we encounter, uh, and not wanting to. Uh, that can come up with other with these interfaith discussions. And I think uh, many of those challenges stem from uh, a sense of guilt uh, because of the history of religious and political violence uh, committed by the church. Um, I think of many examples like, you know, the Spanish Inquisition, uh, shootings at different houses of worship, and the general jewelry uh, we see on social media. And uh, I think the fear of being grouped along with those people and acts makes many Christians hesitant uh, to participate in these kinds of conversations. Uh, but one thing I think is important to point out, however, is that the ability to avoid these conversations is a privilege uh, that no one else, no other background in this country has. Uh, people of other faith backgrounds cannot avoid Western Christian narratives and ideologies because our culture is saturated with them. Um, it's like how uh, many white people, if they so chose, could go their whole lives uh, without meaningful contact with people of color. Um, but people of color can never in this country escape whiteness. Um, but if we are willing to be uncomfortable um, for the sake of unity, obviously not universalism, but unity, um, I think there are great benefits uh, to these conversations. I think um, one of the really important ones, especially for people of a dominant faith culture uh, where they live, is that they get to discover maybe the blind spots and the stereotypes that uh, they never knew they had 
Um, but I think humbling and yourself and accepting that criticism and correction um, can help you love other people uh, the way that they receive it best. Yeah, thank you to all our panelists for answering those questions on just general interfaith conversations. excited to hear them and we're excited to talk to you the question um, in what ways have you personally been impacted by racism what does your religion say about dealing with situations in which you are the victim of racist speech or actions uh, my personal impact is, has been rather minimal it's very easy for me to pass i have worn a kippa for about half my life so this is public but I, I also wear a hat just to protect my bald head and so it's not always so obvious um from a from a jewish racial point of view um the anti-semitic piece which is linked but not the same is, is very different but from for me personally it's been um minimal personal impact um just seeing it around me so i'm gonna stop talking Yeah, I think I have a similar experience uh, in that I am a white passing black person, like very white passing. <laughs> uh, in that it usually it usually surprises people that my mom is actually my mom. Uh, if maybe some of you saw the picture that I I have of my profile picture. Um, yeah, but because of how light skinned I am, uh, people of all types of backgrounds. Uh, when they find out, because I that, that's something that's a privilege I have, is that I get to choose who knows about my ethnic background and who doesn't, which is a very different from um, a lot of people's experiences. Um, or so they either mock me or they become insulted by me uh, just in different ways. Um, from white people, it usually signals that I do not fit the mold of what a black person looks or acts like according to what's in their head. Um, and from other black people, I become the butt of jokes uh, and the ensuing questioning of my black cultural knowledge to prove myself you know, follows. Um, so how many Tyler Perry movies have you seen? Do you know these rappers? That kind of thing, uh, which, you know, is more annoying than actually I find harmful than many of my more uh, dark skinned brothers and sisters. Um, uh, but when I haven't revealed my cultural heritage, I'm around uh, lighter skinned people, I will say, uh, and they think they're in a safe environment, AKA an all white group. Uh, you hear some of the wildest, craziest things you would ever hear. And it's kind of similar to, you know, when you, sometimes when you're in an all conservative Christian group, some of the things I'll say about other religions, you're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you just said that. Uh, and so I think I just have a really interesting experience in that. But how my faith uh, uh, wants me to respond, I think, uh, when I think of uh, what Jesus said about uh, some of his parables. Uh, and for example, in the Gospel of Luke, he says, uh, uh, why do you point out the speck in your brother's eye without looking in your own eye first? You have a log in your own eye, basically. Um, so I think for me, uh, it's important to acknowledge before I condemn other people for their words or actions or prejudices that I myself am a flawed person with blind spots and with um, prejudices that I probably are still waiting to be revealed. Um, but also after you got those process, it's important to, for me personally, as a white passing person, it gives me uh, an opportunity to speak into situations a lot of other people don't have the opportunity to speak into. Um, and while I think my response should be loving as I believe my God is loving, um, sometimes the things he says aren't always nice. <laughs> even though they're loving, they're not always nice. And I'm sure the other panelists would agree when they read their scriptures that even though God is loving, he's not always, sometimes his words hit the heart a little hard. Um, so I think of in Christ, he's talking to one of his churches and he says, 
change your ways, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Like, he's talking about love, but that's not very nice. Uh, yeah, so I think um, the Bible affirms a loving response, a, even, though, even a strong one, but it also wants us to self-reflect. Well, I'd like to comment on this question because it really, um, I would say it really strikes me and hits me to the core. I lived in Palestine. I lived in Jerusalem for a couple of years. I am Palestinian as well. And I've went um, into many different areas. I have many, many, many stories um, in one of the, in some of the scary stories, let's say it that way, where at many times the yeah, I was actually going to the Hebrew University, and of course I was wearing hijab, going to give Atram using the Egged buses, and I was I was supposed to be going to the main bus station, and of course all of a sudden I would get all these undercover soldiers right coming all around me, and almost six to seven m16s right above my head all of a sudden here i am i'm just holding my books and my laptop and all of a sudden m16s are just all around me and each and every single person is pulling the trigger and you're just wondering what is going on what what just happened and i'm right there you know i didn't want to make any move because any move out of six to seven people who already are perceiving you nothing but but a threat and you are right there afraid to make any move and the person is right in front of you asking you to open the bag and you're trying to open the bag but you're afraid that somebody is going to misunderstand opening the bag and trying to get the laptop out and probably just shoot you and right there you know i'm shaking and they're understanding probably my shaking is wanting to do something so this is this is not just once but this is many 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 times where i've had something similar to this actually happen to me. And this is right in Jerusalem, right in, in Palestine. And this is not for no reason, but because I'm Palestinian. And um, this, this not only happened in, in, you know, in just one area, I remember dry, I remember going to the clinic, and all of a sudden, I find myself in the Hashmonaim um, neighborhood, and it happens to be Shabbat. And I was lost, really, I, I wanted to go to the Damascus gate, and I got law, I got lost, and I end up in the Hashmonaim neighborhood. And here I am, I don't know where to go. All of a sudden, I was so lucky enough to get um, a bus driver that happens to be Palestinian that just stops in the middle of the way. And he says, sister, what are you doing here? I said, I'm lost. I don't know what to do. And he says, just get up and uh, just get, go on to the bus onto the bus. I go onto the bus and he just go, gets down just to buy a tibuzim, which is orange juice. And the children, the adults, they just go around the bus that I was riding on trying to be safe. And then they start say, chanting, Mot la'aravim, Mot la'aravim, death to the Arabs, death to the Arabs. And I was terrified. I was terrified. And then the man goes into the bus, goes into the bus, and at that moment, just to see all this, where I was just walking, lost, don't know what to do, I could not fathom the amount of hate these people were fed just by looking at me walking down the street. And you, it's more than just a stereotypical image. I really feel that there's something that must be discussed here. It's not just that. I mean, I was invited to speak on CNN on Michael Smirkanish's show. And the, the, the topic was supposed to be about niqab and covering the face. So they asked me before the show if I could actually come during that in, it was supposed to be in Minneapolis and during the show, if I can wear a different color. I usually wear pink, different colors. And I said, what color do you want? And she said, black. I was really surprised by the word black 
because I said, so why would you want me to wear black face covering and black veil and black body covering and hijab? And she said, it looks better on camera. I said, Michael Smirkanish is not wearing black. She said, well, you know, it's just better because the screen and the lightning and all that. So on that day, I actually didn't wear black and instead I wore red. And I have a picture of myself wearing red niqab, which is the facial co facial covering and a red um, hijab and all that. And just when I sat on the chair ready for the live, the countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, just when they got, they got to 7, they said, cut! And then I could hear them in the background. They said, it doesn't look good with red. We needed her to wear black. That's what you do not see. That's what you do not see in the live and what you get on screen. I was able to hear that in that studio. You don't get to hear that. They stereotype you. They stereotype you because they want a scary black image that delivers a certain racial stereotypical image to bring about a certain agenda this is you know I, sorry for you know um breaking down because every time i remember certain things that you know as a muslim definitely we encounter lots of racism let's just say it that way whether it's because of my religion or whether it's because of the color there's definitely a lot to say Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate your honesty and um, willingness to share that with us. So please reach out to everyone. Um, I guess we can see it. Um, Sophia and Danny, your voice is extremely low. Okay. Are you very... No, Danny, get your, get your, your, maybe your microphone closer. Yeah, it's a lot better, so we'll just get it a little bit more closer, please. Thank you so much. Um, so our next question is, what does your religion say about forgiveness? Is there a place for forgiveness when it comes to racist actions? Um, there's certainly, I mean, in Judaism, a lot said about forgiveness. Holidays focused around forgiveness. Um, there are a couple important points I'd like to make. One is that during the holiday of Yom Kippur, during the high holiday where we focus on forgiveness and atonement, one of the most significant parts of that, I believe, is that we need to seek forgiveness from the people we've wronged before we attempt to seek forgiveness from God. And seeking forgiveness from the people we've wronged needs to be specific. We need to not just say, hey, if I've offended you, I'm sorry, but to speak personally, privately, and specifically about what we've done to hurt them and how it's impacted them. And only then are we clear to approach God about any sort of forgiveness. The other piece as it relates to racism is while I think we as members of the Jewish community have responsibility to the larger Jewish community, true forgiveness can only be granted by the person who has been wronged. It's not possible to seek forgiveness in Judaism in sort of a general sense. There's a book, The Sunflower, that speaks about this in terms of the Shoah, in terms of the Holocaust, where it recounts a Nazi soldier going and seeking forgiveness and speaking to people about forgiveness. And the, the Jewish representative that he speaks to is very clear that he has no power to forgive for others it needs to be done from the people who are wronged and so it's a, a, a tightrope balancing here where we can talk about forgiveness and reconciliation but true forgiveness needs to be on that, that personal one-to-one -one level and i think it's all the more relevant now i'm originally from south africa and with de Klerk's passing recently uh, and his late in his life sort of full convergence to any language of full uh, apology and and remorse for 
apartheid, it's an example of that need for personal connection there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think from a, a Christian perspective, uh, the whole basis for our religion uh, is God making for all a way for all people to be forgiven all their sin. Uh, yeah, that's just like you know the how basically the faith started. Um, there's also I need to talk about forgiveness from coming from us, not just to us, but like from a position where it comes from us. Uh, there is st very strong warnings um, from Jesus about harboring unforgiveness in your heart. Um, so there was a situation uh, where one of his followers uh, asked him how many times uh, they are to forgive someone. And he answered, as was his way, as was with many rabbis at the time, was with the parable. Uh, and he gave him a parable about a king who was settling their accounts. Um, and he had this one man who owed him, uh, it was like 200 years worth of wages. Um, and so the king was going to throw him in jail, uh, but the man begged him and said, please take mercy on me. And so the king does, and he feels pity, and he shows mercy. Uh, and then that servant goes uh, and finds someone who owes him uh, like a month's worth of wages. And they beg him for the same mercy, and he doesn't give it. Uh, he throws the, that uh, person in jail. And so the king finds out about this, and uh, in his frustration, um, takes that servant and throws him into jail again and says, you will not be let out until you can repay all that you owe. Um, and so, uh, uh, let's see where he says, specifically, you wicked servant, I cancel all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Uh, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Um, so he throws him back in jail, and then Jesus follows it up with, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. Um, and then also where one of the other really famous uh, teachings is the Lord's prayer. Um, and one of the lines in that is forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Um, and when you're praying, when, when Christians pray that, they're literally asking God uh, to forgive us according to our forgiveness. Um, and if we make exceptions on that, uh, based on different types of offenses like racism or other problematic actions, uh, we are asking God to judge us the same. Um, so a, from a, a Christian perspective, a New Testament-based forgiveness also doesn't require an apology on the offender's part. Um, and we see this also when Jesus, he hangs on the cross and no one apologizes to him for that. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know what they do. Um, so therefore, from a Christian perspective, our forgiveness to other people is not dependent on the offender, but on the forgiveness we have received. If you allow me to answer um, that question, um, I'm going to integrate it with a previous question in where what does your faith say um, about personally dealing with oppression? I believe that that's what the question was. Um, so it's... It, you know, it's actually a combination in where there is one of my favorite verse in the Quran is actually this verse. It says, and God Almighty orders for justice. Well, Ihsan, Al Ihsan means to give in, to act in the highest principle and orders to give in and embrace the relatives and forbids ill conduct, forbids transgression, aggression, and oppression and this is you know this is just a summary forbids aggression oppression and transgression and orders for justice and the highest principle so why these different things it's justice is when we're actually talking about equity but giving in is when not necessarily are you really waiting for something in response the person might have really transgressed their limit with you but you're giving in you're living up to a higher principle than equity and you're trying to live to the principle of 
prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, in where he was forbearing, according to many of the uh, of the verses in the Quran, it was always describing him as a wahun halim, which means that he was in the highest level of spirituality and he was forbearing, forbearing to give in, even though you had the ability to retaliate. At the same time, it actually emphasizes when uh, many times when we're wronged, we might have the natural feeling, the animal side of us that wants to retaliate, attack, and probably, you know, even go even wilder and if probably even be in a brutal way. So the Lord Almighty sets that principle and says and forbids aggression transgression and oppression whether that aggression was physical or whether that transgression was oral or whether that oppression combined both the oral the physical and probably even economical without you knowing the Lord Almighty calls man to be just and be forgiving and be as Prophet Abraham forbearing. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Bonsuas. I think that, um, yeah, I guess I just want to acknowledge that forgiveness is kind of a difficult ask, especially when the harm of racism is so real and runs so deep. Like you talked about economic effects, emotional effects. Um, so I think it's really powerful that um, all three of uh, the religions that were talked about think of the root as of forgiveness as really important when it comes to being sinned against. But uh, we'll move on to the next question. The next question is, have you ever held racial prejudice towards a people group? Um, how did you address it? And how did your personal faith play into that experience? I guess allow me to answer that question um, really quick. I actually grew up in a home that had different faiths. My grandmother was a Catholic nun, and um, and her being a Catholic nun, of course, it, you know, I'm m most of my family, in fact, all of my family, at least from um, my father's side, is actually Muslim, and. Uh, this I always understood the stereotypes that people had about other faiths from the questions I was confronted with as Muslim in the U.S. and also in and also in from the way that uh, if you can Akram Suri can you please um, mute yourself please um, so I always understood the stereotypes that people had about other faiths from the questions that I was confronted with um, as a Muslim, and even the questions that I was confronted with um, regarding my Catholic grandmother. Um, there were always wonders on, well, are you forcing your grandmother to um, embrace some um, Islam whatsoever? Um, are you are you somehow, you know, offended by the way that she's um, she's dressed because she she was a Catholic nun for 17 years and actually had to leave the convent due to um, mental depression and mental illness. Um, so later she wanted to re-embrace her identity and would wear the habit, um, well, semi-habit, um, even though, you know, she had to leave the convent for some time. But many people would always ask me um, on how we would um, hold conversations with my grandmother, even though, um, you know, we're seeing her do her worship. We would even take her to the church and Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, and we would hold conversations with the priest all the time. So it was it was not something that um, I had actually uh, had to deal with because I understood the differences and understood how people might stereotype you just by looking differently. Mm -hmm. I think when it comes to my story of, of my personal prejudices, um, 
one I'd like to share is actually uh, a, it's about a, it shares a point that uh, we talked about in the, the third option discussion, uh, Sophia, if you remember uh, that at all. Um, and it's about uh, basically not hate projected, uh, but love withheld. Um, and so I think I, I generally I try to be an empathetic person uh, and I try to understand the plights of different people groups. Um, but for a while, one of the ex exceptions to this um, was actually indigenous people groups. Um, up until about my sophomore year of high school, uh, I didn't really have any feelings towards them. I had a few native, I knew a few native students and some were even friends, uh, but either uh, they just didn't talk about their struggles or I zoned out and I didn't care when they did. Um, and that what really confronted me on that actually uh, was we had a pastor from a, a tribe in Arizona. Uh, he came up to our church and he basically had to beg us, uh, a white, a mostly white congregation, to care about the problems we're facing. Um, and I think I was just really that there was someone it's right in your face like that. You're not going to just ignore it. Um, and so. Uh, I kind of had to take a look at, you know, what, why do I have this apathy? Why do, why don't I care about Native issues like I care about my, like, Black issues or poor issues or any or other things like that? Um, and I really had to realize, like, my upgrade, upbringing, where I grew up, I grew up in North Central Minnesota, was really anti-Native. Uh, the, my surroundings, the people I was with, um, all the conversations around local tribes and about their struggles were, oh, they're all, you know, addicted to drugs and alcohol and they're selfish with their land and don't let us hunt on it and don't let us use their lakes to fish. Um, and, you know, I never, I don't think I ever really accepted like the explicit hatred in those narratives just because I, I don't hunt and fish, so I really didn't care whether they let me hunt and fish on their land or not. Um, but I think uh, enough of that uh, hatred had seeped in uh, that I denied my neighbors the love and championing uh, that I would give to other peoples and causes. Um, so how did I address it? Uh, I think my first step uh, was repentance. Uh, so I had to confess uh, my mindsets to God and also um, I didn't really have close Native friends. So I wasn't able to do a lot of the uh, personal uh, repentance. Uh, but I, I, had, I've talk, I had to talk to therapists about it. I've ta I talked to my parents about it. Um, and I just apologized that I had sinned against God's children who he loved dearly. Um, and I just had to ask, you know, God help me uh, to love as you do and to care about the issues that affect them as I know you do. Um, and I think I have been better and I've done better since then, though I'm still well short of perfect. Um, but I think, especially in recent uh, recent times with issues like pipelines and desecration of uh, grave sites and things like that, I think I have become more, um, I'm trying to be more empathetic and attuned uh, to what Native leaders are saying, what they are advocating for, um, rather than just, you know, just sitting in apathy um, and in action. I have nothing useful to add here. Thank you. Judaism the basis for because of the foundation of our of behaviors. 
So Judaism is a legalistic religion in the sense of it provides a path. The halakha is the good we do in it. The justification for these rules, these laws, these divine guidance commandments, what's known as halakha, the, that justification biblically is often phrased in a very simple way. Do this or don't do that because you were slaves in the land of Egypt. That is, you know what it was like to be an oppressed people, and therefore you shouldn't oppress others. And it's important to note these guidance commandments are not only generalized like that but they are very specific do not behave this way treat people this way in particular but the justification remains the same because you knew what it was like there are other concepts about being salam elohim being everyone in the image of god and we speak very clearly about the creation story in genesis that the reason it's important that we have that story is so that no person can claim to be better than any other person. Jewish communities haven't always behaved with those theological imperatives, but they are there in the root and basis of our traditions. I think very similarly, uh, you know, because we have a lot of the same text, Christianity. I don't think much of, if any, I don't know, of, and maybe Rabbi, you can clarify this, but of the Bible really addresses uh, the system and institution of racism and of itself, because in human history, that's actually like a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, but it's more about things like nationality and um, spiritual background and ethnicity than about skin color overtly. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I don't think it's going to surprise us that racism, race is a relatively new concept invented. And so for the Bible, for Torah to speak about it directly would be asking a little much. But in the same way that we have dietary laws that take ethnicities all races because you have jews and then gentiles are just everybody else uh and so like the us that right there the bible just saying like new testament just claiming that all people are reconciled to each other uh, no matter what their background um and racism denies this reconciliation by separating people according to a human conception um so another point uh, that can be made from the scripture of the, the text of the scriptures is the value of every human as image bearers um, of God. Um, to demean other people because of something they cannot control denies them the dignity they are all owed as one who bears God's image. We see this in uh, Genesis 1, where God uh, creates uh, the first humans as, and, and different from all of the rest of creation, uh, they are meant to promulgate uh, God's image. That his very image is placed in them and on them. Um, which gives them a higher value and dignity than the rest of creation, though they still should not obviously abuse the rest of creation. Um, and thirdly, in Christ, all distinctions are made null. Uh, in a letter to the Galatians, the apostle Paul writes, um, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor male and female, for all you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
Um, yeah, basically that just all of the human distinctions of um, people being higher or lower or um, any way that uh, gets in the way of equality has been eradicated. Um, and finally, uh, there's also the hope for the future unity of all peoples uh, worshiping God in Revelation 7, uh, you know, that scary book that people don't like to talk about, Revelation. Uh, <laughs> uh, it reads, uh, after this I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, and the Greek word there can also mean ethnicity, uh, so from every ethnicity, from all tribes and peoples and languages, uh, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands uh, and worshiping. And so uh, the idea there being, obviously, like again, like we've previously discussed, this is not universalism in the sense that it's people of all, like we, you know, we don't have to rehash that again, but is, and the idea is people um, from every sort of ethnic background, language, whatever distinction we have, uh, are totally unified uh, in a in the utopia that is to come. Um, and I think the problem with past attempts to bring about this vision in the, the world we have now uh, was that it was forced, and it was presumed that European Western culture was the normative in heaven. Um, so preaching the gospel for Christians requires us to teach the cultural values of God's kingdom and not Western ideology. And so I think that's an important caveat when talking about the unifying of peoples and uh, trying to find equity is that we are not trying to make all people like each other. We're trying to make them all equal. Those are very different things. Thank you for sharing tonight. Um, for the sake of time, I think I'm going to move on to the next question, but maybe um, Dr. Westwest could start us off. Um, do you um, mind if I answer that question, question, though? What was that? Do you mind if I answer that question? Oh, yeah. You know what? Go for it. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Um, you know, um, the, the rabbi spoke about um, racism and maybe the term is actually not there. In fact, in Islam, it's a little different um, because in the Quran, it clearly laid out the foundation for for um, the human race and that it goes back to Adam even though that's the same thing of Christianity and Judaism but in the Quran it actually says oh man kind we have created you from male and female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may learn from one another and the best of you in the eyes of God Almighty is the nearest to God Almighty at the same time in the Quran it actually considered some of the greatest signs of the the magnificence of the Lord Almighty as in Surah Al-Rum it actually says and from the uh, from the signs of the magnificence of the Lord Almighty is the create is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the differences in your tongues which is a metaphor to refer to um, languages and the differences in your colors and considered that this is a sign to reflect God Almighty's magnificence um, in the farewell speech Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him mentioned in that speech O people your Lord is one there is no preference for an Arab over a non-Arab and a non-Arab over an Arab and not a red over a black that is a black red skinned and black skinned or a black skinned over a red skinned the difference is only in piety the 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 most pious one is the nearest to God Almighty and that's only for God Almighty to judge and in another narration he said all people are from Adam and Adam was created from dust and that's in order to bring in that hum uh, that humility in different narrations in different uh, sources of hadith uh, uh, which is basically the prophetic tradition he clearly emphasized and called racism a form of jahiliya what is jahiliya jahiliya actually means that it's one a principle incoherent with islamic or divine principle it also means an evil an evil act or an evil foundation or an ignorant foundation and practices that will bring evil um evil consequences so just a fast um, mention on that one in terms of islam didn't want to let that question without bringing islam um and what it says on that one thank yeah. you so much thank you for um, thank you for cutting in and answering that question I'm really glad that you brought your perspective um, I will jump down to 
uh, the question, how can religion and personal faith help individuals heal from the pain caused by racism? Yeah, I think in, in, in the Christian Bible, uh, one of the uh, real problems that can come from being uh, offended or persecuted in any way develop uh, just a bitterness of heart. Um, and uh, bitterness poisons the heart and sours life. Uh, so I think for Christians, uh, I think it goes back again to the forgiveness uh, we can offer because of what we have received. It keeps us from uh, that bitterness that can and kind of color um, how we see every situation. Um, it keeps us soft for life, uh, the hardness of heart would seek to take away. Um, and also in Christianity, there's a concept of where identity comes from uh, and the answer uh, for crowned in Christ. So uh, no matter what anyone else says about you or thinks about you or how they mistreat you, uh, how you're seen by God uh, cannot change uh, because of the work of Christ and his work stands forever. Um, and finally, we also believe in a God of justice, uh, a God who says both in the Old and New Testaments, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Uh, so there is hope that God uh, will make all things right. So it is not our job to fix the hearts or change the minds of prejudiced people or to bring down God's wrath upon those people, uh, but no, uh, that whatever hurt uh, we have faced or discrimination that has come against us, um, there will be a day of reckoning. There is hope for justice. Um, and it's not even just future. Uh, some Justice comes now, too. <laughs> so if I can answer um, that question, I think I, um, we would, you know, somehow agree with, with Clay on some parts of it. So healing from any pain really starts with the understanding that God Almighty is most just and he will not allow justice to go without compensation in this life and the hereafter even if you're not able to get the compensation to get that that healing and the payback for the injustice that had happened in the hereafter, God Almighty will still give you that compensation. And it's really important to uh, uh, quote here one of the verses in Surah, um, in Surah Al-Isra, which actually means this, the, the chapter of the children of Israel. It actually said, وَمَنْ قُتِلَ مَنْ فَقَجْعَلْنَا لِوَلِيهِ سُلْطَانًا فَلَا يسرف فِي الْقَتْلِ And whoever was killed um, in any injustice act, then the Lord Almighty will give his guardians the power and authority. So therefore, do not take advantage of that power. Now, this is put speaking about not only, this is although here speaking about, um, you know, killing, but it's actually to include every type of injustice that may happen against anybody that in the end they will be given some power some authority some form of uh, compensation which the lord almighty is here telling them you know don't take advantage of that power and use it in an unjust way in the hadith the prophet peace be upon him had mentioned that god almighty's justice will go beyond dealing um ruling on people to even even include animals where the Lord Almighty on Judgment Day will allow the sheep with horns who had attacked the sheep without horns to actually get its rights and attack back due to the harm that it had that it had faced at the same time you know just a little difference probably with with clay here the Lord Almighty in the Quran actually says the Lord Almighty dislikes people to announce evil. And here's the exception, unless you were um, oppressed. In other words, to announce evil in the case of your to uh, in the case of you being um, a victim is if it is to lead to campaigning and taking the necessary measurements to uplift all forms of oppression in Islam actually becomes obligatory. 
So to just hang in there and pause is actually not what Islam encourages. Islam encourages, no, stand up for oppression. Do the, and take the necessary means to make sure that oppression does not continue because if you continue to stay silent about it, it's going to include others. And Islam actually um, um, it went as far as saying that أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ In fact, it included to say, even though the Muslims in the beginning were taking in the prosecution, but it isn't until this verse was revealed. And it says those uh, uh, that the Lord Almighty had given the permission for those that were prosecuted um, in, in oppression, that they would fight back and your Lord Almighty is the one to give victory and he's capable of giving them victory. And that's why he also had mentioned about the children of Israel when they had obeyed Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and he said, and we wanted to bless those that were weakened and we might wanted them to be leaders and make them the ones to inherit the land after, after all the prosecution they had faced under the hands of the Pharaoh. I'm going to just agree with my colleagues here about the power of the divine, about ultimate justice, and the, whether it's on a time frame that we understand or not, in the world to come, in Olam Haba, or not, that things balance out. Um, I want to put one more point, and that is the focus in Judaism on Tikkun Olam, on reparation and repairing of the world. Tikkun is a Kabbalistic mystical concept that has been interpreted in modern times to mean work for social justice. And it is in that, so far as Jewish tradition lays out what the world should look like, the goal is to fix that world and to bring it closer to God's vision of that world. You, you, Clay is correct. It's not some particular vision of the world, but one that brings true justice and understanding to us. So, amen to it all. And one thing I would just like to add really quickly, uh, just in response to Dr. Was Was, is uh, Christians also have a concept of uh, coming up against oppression. Uh, I just, in the healing process, I just didn't include that as part of my answer. I think part of a, another question that we had been given, though, that I think we skipped over, I think I mentioned that um, Part of Christ's mission, Christian beliefs as Messiah, is to uh, bring about freedom to the oppressed and freedom to captives, uh, as says in the prophet Isaiah. Um, and so we believe as his followers, uh, we are meant to uh, follow his example in that, and that uh, Christ took away the ultimate oppression in our view, being sin and and, and the and judgment. Um, but in uh, our our capacity, obviously, we cannot take sin away from other people, uh, but we can uh, go against other forms of oppression in our world. Thank you for sharing. Um, so our next question really has to work. Oh, oh okay, sorry. Um, do you believe that religion has been hijacked as a catalyst for racism in the past or present? Well, you've given us a softball here. I mean, clearly it has. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have to look too far back in, in history or in the newspapers to see um, religion, religious groups, particular religious groups supporting, for example, the previous administration's stance on immigration, on oppression, on, on an, their anti-Semitic views their anti-Muslim views um, against Black Lives Matter. So um, religion is a powerful piece and all power can be misused. Um, it has certainly been um, misused when political power is put above um, morality and values. I know from my perspective as a Christian, like, where do I begin? <laughs> um, 
uh, like, like Rabbi said, you don't have to go back very far. But actually, a couple of examples uh, that, and the reason why I use these examples is because they particularly anger me because it's not just a use of Christianity in general or religion in general, but they use specific words that were meant to encourage and to uh, uh, stir up good works in God's people uh, to uh, forward oppression. Um, and so uh, one example of this is actually in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, uh, uh, it says, uh, slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly as you were, as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one of you for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And when slave owners would have people read the scriptures to their slaves, that's where they would stop. <laughs> Because it's a convenient place to stop if you want your slaves just to behave well and to not rebel. Um, but if it, if you continue in the reading, uh, the next few verses are about masters. If you abuse your slaves, God's coming for you, basically, <laughs> uh, which is a convenient part to leave out, I think. And so it's also important to mention that when Paul wrote Ephesians, uh, the church did not have the kind of power that we think of, um, we think of the church historically, it was still very new, very young, and could not really uh, have any effect against the Roman political power at the time in their systems. Uh, but I think if he could, he probably would have said something more like he does in a letter to a slave owner named Philemon about one of his slaves who had actually escaped uh, he said, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Uh, and then another scripture I think that gets hijacked, which is also just disgusting to me, uh, is in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, um, where it talks about God's sovereignty over the nations. Um, and it reads, uh, basically, that uh, God has set the times and places of each people group so that they would be able to have the best chance, each, each individual would have the best chance to know him. Um, and the way that that was used in mainly in Reconstruction and the Jim Crow era uh, was to basically say segregation is God's law. Uh, that the boundaries of each people staying away from each other, not intermarrying, things like that, uh, based on racial grounds, uh, they, this was their justification for it. Um, and so, yeah, that's just an example there of people just taking scripture and just ripping apart context to meet their own ends, which unfortunately still happens all the time. Well, I think from my side to answer the question, um, there's no papacy in Islam, so no one can hijack the religion per se, but people can make, and what I mean by people, political leaders, can make choices and claim that that is what the religion te teaches. But the text and legal maxims in Islam are really the reference we turn to in understanding the religion and not people. But at the same time, it is worthy of mention that there were different instances historically. Of course, we know that the Islamic ruling or Muslim, Islamic ruling, Islamic, you know, we're talking about all the way from uh, approximately 675 um, a, um, AD to uh, approximately 1923. So that was pretty much under the Muslim rule actually existed until 1923 um, in March of 1923 with the with the collapse of the, the Ottoman Empire. So we're looking at a very long time of Muslim ruling and throughout um, those many, 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 of course, centuries, you definitely had instances where, as an example, Al-Hakim bi Amrillah, although his name sounds so scary, you know, his name really means he's the ruler by God, by the order of God. When in reality, that man was not, was um, definitely not ruling by the, by the order of God. In fact, 
um, the scholars, the Muslim scholars, Muslim jurists had actually um, written many had given in where he would order um, the the Christian priests to wear huge crosses that were extremely heavy to carry or even the Jews to wear a yellow um, a yellow um, star um, or even wear yellow turbans um, or even uh, even though his mother was Christian but he was doing a lot of a lot of orders uh, giving a lot of orders even on women that they cannot leave their homes etc um, all those orders were rejected by different Muslim scholars but it's really sad that it many times those instances by this lunatic were presented as if it was actually an Islamic an Islamic or uh, ordain or some kind of an Islamic rule and that that's what would happen to all religious minorities in Muslim in Muslim um, rule in where Jews will be asked to wear yellow cross uh, yellow um, stars and uh, King of David and all that and Christians would be ordered to wear crosses the you know as so, so heavy that it would make them kneel um, and get back aches and even women would not be allowed to get out of their homes etc even though that's not necessarily what we would find in the different eras where we had um, Jews Jews living in Andalus, Jews living in Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, the Mizrahi Jews in um, in uh, Yemen, in Iran, in Uzbekistan, and you name the country, and you had under Muslim rule where Jews were actually practicing not only their faith but were even in 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 governance. Same thing with Christians as well. In fact, the Jews had fled. Uh, had fled the Spanish Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisitions to the northern African countries, which were under Muslim rule, um, in in seek of protection, and um, that's where you would have in Jindoba, in in um, in Tunisia, and even in Fez in Morocco, in Algeria, to uh, Libya. In uh, many of them were actually descendants of the the Jews that were actually living in Andalus. So the this is just one one side of it same thing when during the during the world war they also had fled to the ottoman empire at the same at that during that that time in seek of protection um the christians until the time of today you would find christians in in all over the muslim countries all over the muslim countries actually um practicing their faith from those times, even though the Muslim rule was ruling, it did not whatsoever force um, Islam on any and any of uh, the 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 residents there. And in fact, it's a verse in the Quran where it ordered and it um, it announced it in clear words: there is no compulsion in 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 the religion, and you cannot force anyone to um, embrace the religion of Islam. At the end of the day, they have the free will and the freedom to choose to accept it or reject it. So this is unlike what the stereotypical image would always stereotype Islam and Muslims. Yeah, thank you for all our panelists uh, for bringing all of those examples to light. Uh, just for the sake of time, I think I'm going to make this the last question. Um, so I'm going to jump back to one of the questions that we skipped previously. What are some practical ways that we can promote racial equity as people of faith? How has your religion encouraged you to advocate for racial equity on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I, I'm happy to jump here. I think that this gets back to the first question we were asked and difficult conversations. Judaism is a religion of questioning rather than a religion of answers. We don't have a book of answers. We have a series of questions and explorations. The name Yisrael is one is means one who wrestles with God. And in all of the cases, 
Um, these conversations are of both a practical and a theological nature. For this particular approach, I think we continue that tradition. We ask questions, we make them difficult, we listen properly for the answers, and then we stay in community of the people we are working with. Uh, these explorations are often done one-on-one -on -one in a process called Februta, where you challenge each other, where you push each other to come to the truth. And I think those one-on-one -on -one kind of conversations where those relationships continue, where it's not just an experience of, hey, we did this and now we're going to something else, but where you remain in community with that person, um, can, it can be an essential step in this process. Yeah, I think in in Christendom, I, I think it starts in-house. Um, many predominantly white churches ignore the topic of racism until it's right in their face. Um, an example of this uh, would be how many churches reacted after the George Floyd murder. Um, many churches had to grapple with the fact that they had allowed people to remain in hateful mindsets because they had never made a space um, for where they would be confronted. Sermons can also be so, on the topic, can be so lofty and thoughtful that the practicals of what loving your neighbor actually looks like can be lost. Um, and I think it starts uh, with the church leadership. I think the pulpit drives the congregation. Uh, if we want racial uh, equality and equity to be focused on, it must be taught, not just as an aside, but we have to have a whole balanced theology on it. Um, a theology that includes freedom for oppressed people, uplifting of the outcast in real ways like monetary or service, uh, and cooperation and empowerment of persecuted voices, um, like the apostles did uh, in the book of Acts, when they actually uh, got a coalition of people who are being mistreated within the church uh, to actually confront the mistreatment because they knew um, how they're being mistreated specifically. It wasn't just the people who were in power deciding you know, what was hurting the oppressed people, but the actual people being hurt uh, got to have a voice in the, at that table. And I think a theology like that can back real world action. And I think the first step is getting your study on. Uh, learn about how we got here and what solutions leaders in different movements have to offer. Um, so learn about slavery, Native American genocide, Japanese internment, Jim Crow, the sex slave trade, and the prison industrial complex. Uh, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but hopping on the paths that have already been paved. Uh, people from all different faiths, or lack thereof, have been doing the work. Uh, so find out how you can help. Um, maybe it's going to a peaceful protest, or it could be going door to door and asking about voting legislation. Uh, so find what fits you while also being willing to stretch your comfort zone. Um, so I think what drives me uh, is that if what racism says about me is correct, then what I believe God says over me isn't. Uh, so I believe in Christ. Uh, he says he is pleased with me, that I am his and he is mine, that I am seated with Christ beside the right hand of the throne of God in the spirit, and I am clean, pure, and holy. So saying all of those things are true about a person and then proceeding to treat them as less than or grant them fewer opportunities does not make sense. Uh, the fact that me identifying as black can uh, hurt me in job applications or in loans or what school I go to does not align with who I have been made to be according to the scriptures. So I'll uh, answer that one. I hope I can make it, uh, you know, short. I think um, I agree with both a rabbi and um, Clay in where correcting behavior really starts with correcting our perspectives and philosophies. Imposing other ide ideologies in others is one of the most dangerous racist ideologies that are used against many nations. And by that, I mean... Um, secularism and liberalism in historical and even today Palestine under the pretense of advanced race to quote unquote um, colonialism was perpetrated by the idea of imperialism and white man is needed um, 
you know, that's the, the idea that white man is needed to advance black man since he is on the lower level of evolution. And of course, it's really important that as leaders, um, we have to keep in mind all the different atrocities that had happened throughout history. And many times it was politicians using religious leaders in order to perpetuate an idea, in order to lay out some form of a political or an economical economical advancement for one race over the other. And it's really important that we remember as leaders that we first have to start within our own home to implement justice and be aware and that awareness to remember that as leaders, we cannot have people's evil motives decide what and how politics is created on ground and that we have to always remember that justice should be the principle that we carry out and that is the legacy that god almighty had actually given all the prophets so the the element is really to educate ourselves not to become a tool, a tool for politicians but to carry out that we submit to God Almighty and not to man's desires and implement justice even if it goes against our own will and against our own desires and that's where God Almighty actually says don't let the tensions don't let your animosity don't let the, the feelings that you might have against certain people be the barrier between you and just be being just is near to principle and near to being go, closer to God Almighty so therefore as leaders the most important thing is that we can't let a lot of those different areas actually rule and forget what principle really is. There would be many agendas without us realizing, many agendas out there trying to indoctrinate us that this is for the protection of this or that group, or this is be for the sake of um, human rights and the list goes on and on. And, and we would forget that justice is supposed to be the legal maxim that God Almighty had or ordered all prophets to um, to uh, to teach and to stand up to. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Lugwas, and um, thank you to all the panelists for participating today. Um, it was an honor to hear from all of your perspectives. And yeah, so this is the end of our scripted question session. Um, I think we're going to take a break for maybe like three minutes to collect questions from the live audience. And if anyone on Zoom has questions for the panelists, um, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. So we'll meet back here at 43.